All right, everybody. Hopefully everyone can see me and hear me well from wherever you are across the globe. Welcome this evening to our live webinar, Stranger Cases. This is the inaugural episode of Stranger Cases. My name is Eric. I'm a PA working here with MedGeeks, and I'm very excited. I think we have a very interesting case to kick things off. The, uh, the whole point of this series is going to be going through cases where the presentation wasn't typical. So, you know, things are not always what they first appear to be. And that's kind of the idea we have with this. So this is a good case, I think, to start with. You know, I've been following the comments on Facebook that everyone's been participating in. There's been a lot of, uh, of feedback and a lot of uh, supposing what might be going on with our grandma who has back pain. And I'm excited because it seems like people are throwing out a lot of really great ideas. A lot of the, the stuff we'll be talking about tonight. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. If at any point there becomes an issue with the video or the audio, um, you can try reconnecting. Maybe your computer is having connection issues or maybe it's on my end. So feel free to use the chat window uh, to communicate with me. At a few points as we get started, or as we get deeper into the presentation, I'm gonna give y'all a chance to uh, send in chat and some answers to some of the questions that I'm gonna be asking. Um, primarily focusing on developing a differential diagnosis and working up that di differential to figure out what's going on. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, y'all probably already saw the, uh, the case preview that was already sent to you. So you know basically what we're gonna be talking about, uh, but I know you're dying for more information too. Here's an outline of what we'll be doing. Um, and then let's get started. So here's our case. Our case is a 63 year old female who presents to the emergency department and she is complaining of bilateral mid back pain for four days. She's also had one episode of vomiting that happened this morning. She lives out of state and she's currently visiting her two year old granddaughter and has been picking her up frequently. Uh, she reports a history of chronic musculoskeletal back pain. She's been taking Flexeril for this. She says that normally works for her. However, this time it's not. And she also says that her pain is not particularly exacerbated by bending or lifting. So just right here, I know this is already probably more information than uh, what we gave out initially. So for example, the location of the back pain um, can tell us a lot. I wanted to highlight a few things just initially on this initial page right here that kind of stand out. When I first met this woman, this was an actual case of mine about a month ago. She, she was pretty convinced that it was just a muscle issue. And, you know, a lot of times patients are right. It's good to listen to your patients. But at the same time, when things in their story aren't making complete sense with what you know to be the case with most musculoskeletal problems, you have to chase that down a little bit. So I've highlighted a few things here that already were kind of unusual for a musculoskeletal complaint. For one thing, she was vomiting. She told me that she felt like the pain was so severe that it just made her vomit. And I mean, okay, that can happen, but it's not typical when it comes to like a muscle strain or a muscle spasm, that sort of thing. The other thing is that it continues to worsen despite taking Flexeril. And she specifically told me Flexeril normally helps her pain significantly. So the fact that she said that was kind of making me, um, my, kind of making me concerned that something else is going on. And then it's not exacerbated by movement either. And obviously anytime a muscle is, you know, the cause of your pain, moving that muscle or contracting that muscle is, is usually going to exacerbate pain. So those were kind of, I wouldn't call them red flags from the beginning, but just kind of uh, peculiarities with the case from the start. Here's a little bit more history. She described it as achy pain that did not radiate. Uh, occasionally the pain would get worse and then better, uh, but there wasn't any specific trigger for it. There was no recent trauma, no recent fall or car accident. She said that the vomiting occurred, like I said earlier, when her pain was flaring up and she described it as non-bloody, non-bilious. Well, she didn't describe it that way, but when I asked her, it was non-bloody, non-bilious. Uh, past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, iron deficiency, anemia, and she's had an appendectomy, but that was 17 years ago. Here's where her back pain was located, right in the middle of her back, both sides, and that's where she was pointing to saying exactly where her pain was. 
So here's her medications, lisinopril, simvastatin, and then as we mentioned, cyclobenzaprine as needed for muscle spasms. But for the average 63-year-old patient, not too bad of a med list. Here's her review of systems. Mostly negative. She did have a decreased appetite and you know that along with the vomiting again was kind of making me think this isn't musculoskeletal um, but really that was the only thing positive appetite vomiting and back pain she didn't have any chest pain she denied abdominal pain she denied shortness of breath um, and overall i mean you know just looking at her in the exam room she looked pretty comfortable at the time i was talking to her uh, so here i've underlined some of the pertinent negatives no fever no chest pain no cough and no urinary symptoms either. She wasn't complaining of any blood in her urine, um, no burning when she urinated. So pretty benign as far as the history uh, goes. Here are vital signs. Again, these are normal. Afebrile, normal heart rate, blood pressure is controlled, a little high, but you know, for an, for an ER patient who's in enough pain to come to the ER, that's not a bad blood pressure. So hopefully you're already starting put to put together a uh, differential diagnosis. In a second, I'm going to ask you all to, to send in maybe the top one or two things that you would consider to be your, your top differentials, and then also what you would want to do to evaluate that, what tests you'd want to order, if any. So be thinking about that and be ready to send them in. So here's her physical exam. And then here's the easier to read version of the physical exam where I put in yellow the, uh, the stuff that's abnormal. So she did have some epigastric discomfort. I don't know that I'd call it vocal tenderness. You know, she wasn't guarding. She wasn't wincing. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a very significant thing. However, it was there. It was more than just a a totally normal abdomen but she had been vomiting so I thought maybe she's just having a little bit of like spasms or something like that or could be something else so at this point let's talk about differential I mean send in type if you if you don't mind send it I see some of you already have been but send in one or two differentials you're thinking about now that you've seen the physical you've got a pretty decent history and what are you going to do to work it up? You know, what's the what's the testing that needs to happen in order to figure it out? So I'm seeing a lot of really good stuff that everyone's sending in. I'm seeing pneumonia. I'm seeing I'm seeing the stuff that you can't miss. I'm seeing triple A. I'm seeing heart attack. Yeah, myocardial infarction. Um, nephrolithiasis, pancreatitis. And it's good. It's good. Yeah. So I think y'all are all thinking along the, the lines that, you know, the, the bottom line here is when it comes to back pain, there is so much that could be causing back pain in this patient, particularly now that our attention is a little bit more focused on the abdomen as well. Um, someone saying a, a PE would do a CT scan. That's really not a bad thought at all. Um, pulmonary embolism in this case. The, the thing also to consider is that this is a female patient. And this is an older patient. Um, and both of those things tend to have uh, cardiac presentations that are a little bit atypical. So women and elderly patients tend to have a, a little bit different presentation when it comes to having a heart attack, for example. They, they may not even complain of chest pain. That's a very common thing. Um, so you, you definitely need to consider cardiac problems as well as pulmonary things. Um, and then aortic dissection and AAA, certainly those things can both radiate to the back. And we're talking mid back in this case. So, I mean, you know, low back is one thing, upper back is another thing, and mid back is kind of both, right? I mean, if they've got a dissection or if they've got a AAA, both could potentially radiate to that area. Okay. So everyone is doing a fantastic job. I'm very, very pleased. So that means we're on the right track. So I'm going to show you my differential diagnosis. Here's the, the differential that I had going in my mind. And I, 
not everyone does this, but I tend to create a differential that's kind of the most likely, the thing that I think it probably most likely is to be. And then I've also got this list going on the side, uh, most dangerous, or in other words, the things that you really can't miss. And, you know, you, you basically, I don't think anyone's listed anything that's not on here. I, I think pretty much everyone said what I have on here, too. Um, someone just mentioned rhabdo. That's a good consideration as well. Certainly muscle pain can, could come in the form of rhabdo or rhabdo could come in the form of muscle pain. But so for my most likely muscle strain, I mean, I know that's kind of obvious. We probably wouldn't be doing the case if it actually turned out to be muscle strain. But, you know, if you're in my shoes in this situation, muscle strain is still near the top. Herniated disc, renal colic and pilo. I mean, that mid back area is right where the kidneys are. It's kind of that costovertebral angle region. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention on the physical exam, it was there. There's actually no tenderness on the back. Um, she was definitely indicating that that's where her pain was, but I couldn't actually press on the back and reproduce that pain. And that's significant just because muscle pain is typically reproducible or uh, any sort of uh, skeletal pain. You can usually reproduce it by pushing on it. So that told me maybe this is more of a radicular type pain. But nonetheless, muscle strain is still on my list. And uh, all the most important stuff, the most dangerous stuff, acute MI, aortic dissection, AAA, PE, and malignancy. What kind of malignancy am I talking about? I'm talking about bone cancer, whether it's primary or metastatic. You absolutely could get back pain due to uh, you know, a bony tumor there in the thoracic spine, which is where she was uh, experiencing pain and and usually when you have pain that's in a, in a bone due to like a malignancy it's kind of a vague sort of pain uh, that's not necessarily reproducible with motion sometimes it is though and then worth considering in her case would be herpes zoster uh, shingles the the reason that's less likely in her case is the fact that bilateral shingles is kind of isolated to to one side and uh, vertebral fracture. I put that in there because it's worth considering. In elderly patients, it doesn't take a whole lot of trauma to produce a, uh, a fracture. So uh, like a wedge fracture, for example. So next question, and y'all have been sending in these as well. What do you think we should do in terms of a workup? This lady obviously deserves a workup. When you're in the emergency department, that's kind of a big uh, a decision point for you with every patient that you see. Are they going to get a workup or are they not? You know, some people you can really rely on history and physical to figure out what is uh, going on uh, or more importantly, sometimes figure out what's not going on. But in this case, she definitely needs a workup. And let me show you what we did for the workup. This is the workup I pursued for her. So as far as labs, I ordered a CBC, CMP, lipase, troponin and UA. I did order a chest x-ray and a thoracic spine x-ray and an EKG. I, uh, I was kind of on the fence about the thoracic spine x-ray. That was mostly just because she said she had been doing some lifting um, and she was having some pain there. Yeah, I, I wasn't super concerned about malignancy, um, but I, I did want to just go ahead and get it just because in an elderly patient and you're not entirely sure what's going on, you tend to over order a little bit. Maybe that's not the most responsible, but I did. Um, I'm seeing someone list or multiple people have listed a D dimer. I have that under the other considerations column, um, as well as a CT gallbladder ultrasound and CT angiogram. Um, so I, I did not order that initially. However, I was considering it. So I definitely wanted to do a cardiac workup. That's why we got the EKG and the troponin. I definitely wanted to get a chest x-ray and I definitely wanted to get those labs, as I mentioned before, you know, any sort of gallbladder disease, pancreatitis and so forth. You want to check uh, a comprehensive metabolic panel and a lipase as well. So let's take a look at what happened next. Here's the EKG. I'll let y'all take a look at that for a second. The EKG is essentially normal. I mean, let me put up here what I have. She's got a normal sinus rhythm, rate of 68. 
particularly if there's no ST elevation or depression, no T wave inversions. So really not an ischemic appearing EKG, no evidence of infarction. So this is reassuring that it's, you know, less likely cardiac, but we definitely still wanted to get the troponin as well. All right, let's take a look at the chest X-ray. Here's her chest X-ray. And this chest X-ray was not revealing of any obvious pathology. One of the first things I would look at in a chest X-ray of this patient with this complaint, particularly as back pain in an elderly patient with hypertension, where we're worried about dissection would be any sort of widening of the mediastinum. Uh, you're going to see that in not all, but approximately 80 to 85% of aortic dissections will have some sort of abnormality on the chest x-ray. Usually it's going to be widened mediastinum. Let's take a look here at pertinent negatives on this particular film. I didn't see any infiltrates, hearts the right size, no pleural effusion. Again, mediastinum looks normal. No pneumothorax, trachea midline, etc. And there's no free air under the diaphragm. If this lady had a bowel perforation, you would possibly see uh, a, a small amount of air underneath the diaphragm. That's why I mentioned that there. So chest X-ray is is huge. I mean, there's there's so much that you can get into with a chest X-ray that we don't have time in this case right now. But the um, the chest X-ray is incredibly valuable. There's so many things you can pick up there. Let's go to the next slide here and look at the thoracic spine X-ray. Not that that, I'll be honest, this has not come from the actual patient, um, but this particular x-ray is normal. There's a little bit of uh, degenerative changes, but there's no fracture, um, no wedge fracture, and then also no signs of any malignancy. So it looked good. As far as our imaging, so far everything checks out. So let's look at some labs. Here's our CBC. Her CBC looks pretty normal. There's no white count, which is good. She's not even anemic, even though she did have that in her history. I remember, uh, I don't think I put that on her med list, but she was taking some iron supplements and they're obviously helping. You can see her, her MCV is 86. That's what tends to go down. That's the mean corpuscular volume of 86. If that was below 80 or, or low, that tells us that we're dealing with a uh, microcytic anemia. Well, in this case, she's not even anemic, but if she was anemic and had a decreased MCV, she would have a microcytic anemia. And the most common form of that, or the most common cause of that is um, iron deficiency anemia, which she has a history of, but her labs look normal. I mean, this, is, uh, this was reassuring. Let's look at the CMP, Comprehensive Metabolic Panel. So I'll review that for a second. So it's mostly normal as we get to the bottom. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't bold it on the first slide because I didn't want it to be obvious, but towards the bottom, we see what is a very abnormal finding. So she's got some, some abnormal LFTs, as we say. ALKFOS, AST, ALT are all markedly elevated. This isn't even just like kind of elevated. I mean, it's like significant. It's not uncommon to see an AST, you know, let's say of like 50 or 60 or an ALT of 90 or 100 even. And it doesn't make me super nervous. Um, or maybe even ALKFOS is slightly elevated. There's a lot of things that can cause that. However, when you see numbers like this that are oh, 300 or more, you know something's going on. And all of a sudden, you know, our focus is uh, is honing in on a potential biliary problem. So just a quick review, ALKFOS is something that gets released when there's any sort of biliary stasis. So the bile is not flowing through the bile ducts. You can get ALKFOS increase, or you could also get GGT increase. I don't routinely order that myself. I'm not sure 
um, it maybe if any of y'all who are in practice are, are ordering GTT, but certainly that's another one that goes up with biliary stasis. AST and ALT are kind of nonspecific. However, they, they do tell us that there's something irritating the liver. So they don't necessarily tell you what that is, but it's kind of the liver is inflamed. There's some sort of damage to the hepatocytes going on. And with the ALKFOS elevated, is probably something obstructive going on, is what this picture is telling us right now. So uh, bilirubin is normal, though, which is good, because that's another thing that tends to go up if there's like a severe obstructive problem going on, is the bilirubin will jump up as well. Fortunately, hers is normal. So obviously, our differential needs to kind of hone in a little bit now that we, we see this. Before we get to that, though, let's look at her UA. So her UA is kind of normal. She does have Luke esterase that's positive. Um, and there is some bacteria, some squames in her urine. So yeah, maybe she's developing a UTI here. I don't think that a, a, a UA that looks like this is necessarily screaming that she has pyelonephritis. So definitely less likely that pylo is what's going on, particularly given what we saw in the last uh, slide with the LFTs markedly increased. And her lipase is normal and her troponin is normal. So the lipase is uh, significant for the fact that it would go up if there was pancreatitis going on, but she doesn't appear to have that. So we go back to our differential diagnosis list. This, uh, this is the original list that we started with. I'm gonna rearrange it here because we've got more information. Biliary disease jumps toward the top. So biliary disease towards the top because of what we saw. Uh, we can rule out pancreatitis just because, at least for now, because her, her lipase is normal. You could also check an amylase to see if that was abnormal, which I did not do, but lipase was normal. Acute MI, she, her, her trope is negative. Her EKG is normal. Um, not an unreasonable thing to maybe wait another three hours, to check a second troponin, given her age in particular. Uh, malignancy, we didn't see any sign of malignancy. I guess I can't say there's no malignancy anywhere. However, you know, there's no obvious tumor in the thoracic spine. We already said herpes zoster is out, vertebral fracture was not seen on x-ray. A lot of things we haven't ruled out at this point. That's kind of the, the main point of this slide that we're looking at. There's a lot of things that have not been ruled out. Um, for example, the, some of the big ones, aortic dissection, AAA, PE. However, when you see something that could obviously be the cause and explain what her symptoms are, such as something with the biliary tree, that becomes more likely. Um, but you got to be careful not to miss things. In her case, let's talk about what could be causing her biliary disease. Uh, cholecystitis, which is uh, infection or inflammation of the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis, stones in the gallbladder. Cholelithiasis, which is when you get a stone that's left the gallbladder and is in the common bile duct. And then we have ascending cholangitis, and that's when you get a nasty infection. So what are we going to do next? What would y'all want next in this patient now that we know what we do know? Because I don't think we're done yet. Um, we, don't, we don't necessarily have our diagnosis. So what would be the, uh, the next test or the next intervention that this patient needs? I'm seeing someone say MRCP. Luann is saying MRCP. And I think that's a great consideration. MRCP uh, would definitely help us figure out what's going on as far as is there a stone is, uh, that's causing these symptoms or another problem too. Seeing right upper quadrant ultrasound, bedside ultrasound, abdominal ultrasound. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Y'all are right. Which is what I did. Um, I, uh, I ordered a gallbladder ultrasound or a right upper quadrant ultrasound. And here's what it showed. These were the findings. Numerous gallstones, no pericholecystic fluid, aka no fluid around the gallbladder, which is something that we sometimes see in cholecystitis. The gallbladder wall thickness was normal and common bile duct diameter was nine millimeters, which is elevated. So that's a dilated common bile duct we didn't see any stone within the common bile duct. So just a, particular, uh, a special note 
here. Just because there's not a, a visualized stone on the ultrasound within the common bile duct doesn't mean that there isn't one there. And ultrasounds are not particularly sensitive for a stone that's distal in the common bile duct. So, and that's just due to overlying bowel gas. So you can't necessarily see it if it's there. But what we do know is that the common bile duct diameter is nine millimeters, normal's less than four. Um, sometimes if you've got an older patient, that can normal can be a little bit larger than four without there necessarily being cholecholecholithiasis present. However, in her case, I mean, nine millimeters is pretty large. Plus, she's having symptoms that are indicating that there's a problem going on. Plus, her labs were, uh, were abnormal. So that's what we got going on right now. Let's look at the next slide here. Let's go through that uh, biliary differential that we had. Cholelithiasis, yes. The answer is yes. She does have that. We saw that on the ultrasound. Cholelithiasis, I don't think we've necessarily 100% said that that's true at this point, although it's highly suggested by the fact that she, uh, she had labs and imaging that way. Uh, Sherry's asking, were there positive Murphy's sign on exam? And I, I would say no. Uh, she did have a little bit of discomfort when I was pressing in the epigastric area, but I wouldn't call it a, a slam dunk Murphy sign, and there wasn't a sonographic Murphy sign either. Cholecystitis at this point, I would call it unlikely based on what we know, because there's no gallbladder wall thickening, no fluid, and then she didn't have a white count either, normal vitals. And then ascending cholangitis, for the same reasons, is unlikely. There's no white count, no fever, no jaundice. And she looked really fine. I mean, she looked clinically, she looked very well. So what are we going to do next? What's the next step? I'm seeing someone say ERCP. ERCP for diagnosis and removal of stone. That's a consideration. Does anyone have any other consideration? I know someone already said MRCP earlier. And we're going to talk about what all these studies are, what these tests are in just a moment. I think the next slide actually. So at this point, what we're what we're thinking is this is probably cholecholithiasis. I think that's probably the most common thing. Certainly other things could be going on that could cause her AST and ALT to go up like hepatitis. Um, but when we know that she's got stones and common bile duct dilation, it's probably cholecholithiasis. At this point, if you were to call uh, GI, and GI are, is the specialty that manages this, if you were to call them, they would probably want a little bit more imaging. So let's look at our options. And that's what happened in this case. I called GI, and I'll tell you what he told me in a second. But these are our imaging options when we're thinking cholecholithiasis, but we haven't seen a stone on the gallbladder ultrasound itself. In ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Okay, that's really hard to say. That's why we say ERCP. An ERCP is a procedure uh, where they go down with a scope and they actually inject some dye and it gives a good outline of the biliary tree. And you can very, very reliably pick up a stone if there is one in the common bile duct. The nice thing about an ERCP is that it's diagnostic and it's also therapeutic because while you're there, you could definitely remove that stone uh, most of the time. So that's, that's a plus. And I would say that used to be kind of what most of the time would happen next would be an ERCP. And it's still, if you have a really high suspicion, that's probably what GI would do. Um, there is a risk of pancreatitis um, associated with ERCP. And that's a common board question, by the way, is when you're talking about the causes of pancreatitis, recent ERCP is definitely uh, not a super common, but not super uncommon either cause of, ERC, of pancreatitis. And that's because the contrast dye is being injected into that biliary tree. And one of the branches of the biliary tree is the pancreas, the pancreatic duct. We have a picture of that later. Um, so it's, and it's definitely an invasive test. I mean, you know, you're doing an upper endoscopy uh, and injecting dye and so forth. So this is certainly invasive. Another option is an endoscopic ultrasound. This is diagnostic, but not therapeutic because we're just looking. So it, it's also invasive, less so than an ERCP, 
Um, you're not injecting any contrast dye or anything like that, but it is still an upper endoscopy. And then MRCP, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography. That was pretty good. That sounded pretty natural, actually. This is diagnostic, but not therapeutic as well, just like the ultrasound would be. And this is really not invasive. So not invasive because we're not having to actually insert a camera into the patient in any sort of way. It's, it's an MRI where we are taking a look at the biliary tree. So that's what, when I called GI, that's what they wanted to do. They said, let's confirm that this is cholelithiasis before we do any sort of invasive procedure to figure out what's going on. If the patient were less stable, or maybe if she was really jaundiced and really sick, I think in that case, I'm not, I don't work in GI, so I don't speak for, for all GI specialists when I say this, but I think that would be an indication to possibly take her directly to ERCP because you have a little bit more tools at your disposal to do something about it and diagnose it at the same time. Um, but in her case, since she looked great, she was stable, we went with the MRCP. And here's what the MRCP showed. Gallstone in the distal common bile duct. It was there after all. So that was kind of the uh, the moment where it's like, okay, awesome. And this patient was being admitted at this point anyway, but I was still following along. And we, we did see on the MRCP that there was a stone in the common bile duct. Uh, why is it significant that I said it's proximal to the ampulla of Vater? And for those of you who don't remember, the, the ampulla of Vater is the point where the, I, I can't really see, hang on, let me see if I can use this little feature here and draw. Let's see, bear with me. Here we go. I'll see my yellow arrow. Oh, this is cool. That right there, it's not the right color. That right there is the ampulla of Vater. And that's kind of like that branch point between the, where the common bile duct meets the pancreatic duct. So if the stone had been distal to that, and still obstructing, still there, uh, not yet passed through the sphincter of Odie, that increases your likelihood that you're going to get pancreatitis. And that is why it's significant. So in her case, you know, remember her lipase was completely normal and she did not have any sort of pancreatitis going on, but that's how it happens. If the stone has moved past that branch point and fluids backing up not only into the liver, causing the LFDs to rise, it's also backing up into the pancreas and the patient can have gallstone pancreatitis as well. Okay, so close this. Got it. Okay, so this is what happened with the patient. They were admitted, they were made NPO, put on pain control, antiemetics and IV antibiotics. I started her on Zosin after talking with the uh, the GI specialist, we put her on Zosin. Uh, they went underwent ERCP after we got the MRCP, knowing where the stone was, and they retrieved the stone. The patient was feeling better after that point. LFTs improved, and the patient was asymptomatic. They then went ahead and did a cholecystectomy a few days later. So in addition to consulting GI for this patient, I also got general surgery on board as well because frequently they will work together in patients like this because um, cholelithiasis kind of falls into the arena of GI, whereas cholelithiasis that's symptomatic or cholecystitis would fall more into the, uh, the territory of general surgery. So urine culture, just to give a closed loop to the, the UA that we saw, the urine culture didn't grow out anything. Um, didn't grow out any bacteria. She was discharged two days later after the cholecystectomy. Uh, good question from Vincent just now. Is cholecystectomy necessary? That's a good question. I don't know that I would say it is necessary, necessary. However, we do know that she's got a ton of stones. We do know that she's symptomatic. And we do know that some of the stones are known to, to come into the common bile duct. So we do know that recently, like if you don't do it now, there's probably a good chance you're going to need to do this again if you don't go ahead and take the gallbladder while she's here. Um, I think a case could be made for this being done on an outpatient basis, though, cholecystectomy. And Zosin being just prophylactic. In this case, yeah, it's just prophylactic because she really wasn't showing any signs of acute infection. Um, 
I think, you know, in cases like this, particular, particularly in an older patient, you don't want to see things go downhill quickly like they sometimes can. So that's why we went ahead and did Zosin. Uh, and at that point, we didn't have the MRCP either uh, when we started the Zosin. So just kind of covering more bases until we had a more definitive diagnosis. So this is just kind of a summary. Um, the patient did have cholecholithiasis, gallstone in the common bile duct. This is usually going to present with epigastric pain, right upper quadrant pain. It does commonly radiate to the back. And in her case, that was kind of her main symptom was radiation to back without the abdominal pain. And that's what always, that's what kind of threw me through a loop at the beginning. Um, and obviously it's associated with nausea and vomiting. Kind of a similar presentation with just symptomatic gallstones in general or cholecystitis as well, except in that case, you might be getting febrile. Usually you're gonna have the uh, elevation of ALKFOS, AST, and ALT early on in the course. Bilirubin will also increase later on in the course of the disease. We talked about the imaging options that we, we had to figure out what was going on. The ultrasound of the right upper quadrant is kind of first line. Common complications from cholecholithiasis is ascending cholangitis, and these patients generally look pretty sick. Um, they will sometimes be jaundiced even. They're going to have a white count, they're going to have a fever, things like that, and they need uh, antibiotics, absolutely need antibiotics in that case. Pancreatitis, like we were talking about, depending on where the stone is, and it doesn't necessarily need to be all the way past that ampulla of water. If it's close enough to it that it's just kind of, you know, compressing on that pancreatic duct, it could definitely cause pancreatitis. And then cholecystitis is a common complication as well. Definitely need to consult GI and often you will consult general surgery as well because the stone had to come from somewhere. They usually have gallstones as well. And that's why there's usually a discussion of taking out the gallbladder as well. So let's go back to when we first started with the differential diagnosis. Um, this is what we started with. Let's look at what happened. I always like to revisit, I mean, this, this space of this operating in this mental space of the differential diagnosis. I mean, think of it as like a, a room in your brain that you go to, right? Where you kind of revisit it and I picture a, board, a room with just like whiteboards all around it and you just constantly have to be revisiting it so you don't miss things. Um, people are, have been very vocal about aortic dissection, AAA, PE, and I, I will be fully honest with you, in my, in my evaluation of this patient, the way I worked them up, I don't feel like I ruled those things out. Just because, um, just because I ruled in cholecholithiasis doesn't mean I ruled out an aortic dissection or a AAA or a PE. Um, I mean, this patient could be extremely unlucky. They could have multiple things going on. Um, that being said, I do feel comfortable that I didn't miss it. Um, and admitting the patient and, and letting a lot of people observe and monitor them for the next week. And, you know, certainly if this was an aortic dissection or a, a rupturing AAA, those symptoms would present themselves a lot more. So if I were to have ordered all of those tests that I did, and let's say the LFTs came back normal, and all of a sudden we... Uh, we don't have cholecholithiasis. At that point, I probably would have done exactly what I'm doing now and come back to the differential diagnosis and say, do I need to do more of a workup? Do I need to work harder to rule out some of these more dangerous things? Um, because I've ruled out the most likelies and I'm, now I'm kind of stuck with the most dangerous uh, diagnoses to work up. And if this patient looked a little bit more unstable or if they were also complaining of chest pain or if there was something in the history that was more worrisome, um, I probably would have gone ahead and worked up uh, dissection, AAA, PE, alongside my initial labs. So let's talk more about what we would do uh, if we wanted to. So we know it was biliary disease in this case. We know that. These are the things that are left unruled out, if you will. And I just want to take a few minutes to kind of go through and talk about what you would do in that case, because I feel like I don't want to leave you all hanging because we talked so much about these potentially being the case. For a muscle strain, a muscle strain is a clinical diagnosis. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to fully rule that out. It's more of a diagnosis of exclusion based on history and physical exam. Um, a herniated disc, if you wanted to, to completely, you know, definitively diagnose that, you would need some imaging. 
CT or an MRI of the affected area. You wouldn't need contrast for that. Um, as far as an emergent setting, if there's any sort of neuro deficit or very severe pain or the patient's not walking or have any sort of loss of function, then it's indicated to go ahead and get that imaging in the emergency department. Um, in her case, though, she was you know, functioning very well, so I didn't feel that was necessary. Renal colic. So let's talk about that. I feel like I'm pretty confident that in her case, it wasn't renal colic. However, absence of hematuria, because she didn't have hematuria, absence of hematuria is not 100% though. You can't rule out um, renal colic just based on the fact that there's no blood in the urine. You'll miss about 10 to 30% of those. CT, abdomen, pelvis without contrast is how you would diagnose. That's kind of the imaging study of choice, particularly if it's a first time stone. You can also do a renal ultrasound and an abdominal x-ray. That's going to be looking for hydronephrosis, plus you can sometimes see a stone on just a plain film x-ray and you can get the size and location from that. This is not as sensitive as a CT scan, but if you know that the patient makes stones or you know they have an active stone, you don't want to just CT their belly repeatedly because that's a lot of radiation and we don't need to do that necessarily. So that's how I would approach these three. Um, for a peptic ulcer, uh, definitive diagnosis, you would need an upper endoscopy. You could do H. pylori testing as well. And a lot of the stuff in the history would, would clue you in as well. CBC would also be helpful if they've got anemia. Maybe this is a bleeding peptic ulcer disease, so upper GI bleed. Look for free air under the diaphragm on abdominal films, and you can do a stool guaiac as well to look for bleeding. Uh, AAA, abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is one of those ones where it's very dangerous and you don't want to miss it. Um, on physical exam, you will sometimes be able to palpate uh, a pulsatile mass. That's kind of the classic thing. Um, but a lot of these patients are, are obese and you can't feel their aorta particularly well. So you have to have a high index of suspicion if you can't find another reason for their back pain. So what do you do? Imaging is the way you do it. Abdominal ultrasound versus a CT abdomen pelvis with IV contrast. Um, most people would go straight to the CT. The reason for that is a CT is very good at picking up the presence of the aneurysm itself as well as whether or not it's ruptured. But honestly, if with a ruptured AAA, you usually don't need imaging for that. You can kind of tell that it's ruptured because they're very unstable and you need to be taking them to the OR now. Um, abdominal ultrasound, though, is, is almost just as sensitive. It, I mean, it's near 100% sensitive, just like a CT is, to detect the aneurysm, but less reliable when it comes to the rupture. So that's how you'd rule out a AAA is with CT or abdominal ultrasound. Let's talk about PE. This is another thing that we frequently rule out in the emergency department. The gold standard to rule out a PE is a CT pulmonary angiogram. Um, so if you had a high index of suspicion and you just wanted to go for it, you could go straight for that and see if there's any evidence of PE. Um, if you also wanted, if, let's say that you have very low risk a patient, let's say you don't particularly suspect that's necessarily what's going on, but you think maybe there's some clinical decision tools that we have at our availability. And um, let's talk about those right now. So there's the Wells criteria. Let me go to the next slide real quick. Here's the Wells criteria on the left. Wells criteria kind of helps you determine what the pretest probability of a PE would be. And you add up the points if they're positive. And basically, if a patient falls into the score of zero to one, they're considered low risk. Uh, two to six are intermediate or seven or more high. Basically, what I'm talking about in this case is a low risk patient. You would consider moving on to a D-dimer test um, if they're PERC positive. So, for example, frequently in the ER, you would you'd see a patient that comes in and let's say their Wells criteria low. Then you advance to use the PERC rule, PE rule out criteria. And that's this on the right right here. And basically, if they have any of these things, it doesn't matter. There's no points or anything. It's just yes or no. If any of these criteria under the PE rule out criteria are yes, then they're PERC positive, we say. And at that point, in a low risk patient, you should consider D dimer testing or just going straight to a CT scan if, if you're worried about that. So, frequently the pathway is okay, they're low probability, they're PERC negative, then 
I'm not so worried about it. It's probably not a PE. It's probably something else. No further workup. But if their PERC rule was positive, such as in this patient, she's PERC positive because she's uh, older than 50, um, then you would want to do a D-dimer test. And D-dimer tests are kind of the, the bane of the ER or urgent care anywhere where you're ordering them because you know, it's kind of like rolling the dice. If the D-dimer is positive, you have to do a CTA. Uh, but if the D-dimer is negative, you high five everyone around you and say, hey, cool. I didn't think it was a PE. I just wanted to make sure and the dimer is negative. Um, I will say though that this this whole process, this whole pathway I'm going through, I mean, could be a whole lecture in and of itself. Um, but I will say that um, people utilize these tools differently in terms of relying on them. Some people don't trust them as much. And so you definitely want to, you know, learn from the people around you who, you know, maybe have more experience or, or so forth. Don't, uh, don't let these tools completely dictate what you're doing all the time. Um, another thing that we need to rule out was aortic dissection. So just like PE, you want to get a CTA. It's a different uh, type of CTA, though. I think they have different protocols for the timing of the, the dye and so forth. I'm not 100% on that, though. But it's a CTA uh, is the gold standard. Uh, I mentioned earlier the chest X-ray is going to be abnormal 85% of the time when you have an aortic dissection. Usually, mediastinum is widened. Um, you get a pleural effusion, abnormal aortic or cardiac contour. Here's the most important thing, though. It's not sufficient to rule out. A dissection. So if you really think they may have a dissection, don't just order a chest x-ray. You have to do more. We talked about a clinical decision tool for PE. There's also one for aortic dissection. It's called the Aortic Dissection Detection Risk Score. I'm not going to read all this, but I want you to know it's a thing. So basically, there's three categories that we try to put our patients into. Predisposing conditions, pain features, and physical findings. If they meet any of these boxes, it's worth a point. So then, if they're a score of zero to one, uh, you consider just doing a D-dimer, just like in PE. If that's elevated, do a CTA. Two to three, just go straight to CTA. So here are those categories again. Um, you know, a D-dimer test is, is one of those things where it's it can be helpful in a low-risk patient in order to, to rule things out without doing the, the massive workup. OK, so that's everything in terms of all the differentials. The, uh, the, rule, the last thing I want to say about rule outs, particularly with those last tool, those tools that we were going through, don't, uh, don't let these clinical decision tools kind of override your clinical judgment. In other words, don't, don't say, oh, this is you know the decision tool thinks it's fine. Then I'm not going to worry about it. You still have to sleep at night. You know, you still it's still your patient. They're tools, and you're the one that's wielding them, not vice versa. So always rely on the fact that you have a, a functioning brain, and you're very smart, and you have an excellent education, and you have tools at your disposal. Use your clinical judgment. Uh, that being said, they can really help. And these decision making tools can really help because we don't want to just be CT scanning everyone. So that's kind of the reason that they were developed. So here's some key takeaways. Do not assume that the patient is right. So that may sound a little mean at first, but certainly listen to your patient, consider what they're saying, but don't assume that they're right. This patient, when she first came in and saw me, she was pretty sure she knew exactly what was going on. And she was telling me, hey, you know what? All this is is my muscle strain. I get this all the time. I've been picking up my granddaughter a lot and that's all it is. I just need something a little bit stronger. You know, I just need like some Tylenol with codeine or something just to get me through the next couple of days and uh, and I'll be fine. And I'm going to fly back home and I'll follow up with my PCP. I mean, I could have very easily and I'll be honest, I almost did. I could have very easily just said, you know what? Sounds like a great story to me. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't we do that? But something just seemed off. Maybe it was her age, the history about the flex rule not working. The vomiting was a little fishy. So don't assume the patient is right. Make sure that you're actually doing your. Uh, your due diligence on that and using your own thought processes as well. Um, pay attention to the discrepancies from a typical presentation. So whenever there's things that kind of send up those uh, yellow flags, if you will, when you're getting your history, um, pay attention to them and think, man, maybe something else is going on here. Consider the other organ systems around that region of the body. Consider 
uh, what else may be going on. Uh, the next point, many intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pathologies will cause radiation of pain to the back. And that's basically all the stuff we had on our, uh, on our differential, plus more. On his, there's more stuff too. But there's a lot of stuff that causes back pain. And what's really frustrating is there's a ton of people with back pain. So constantly going through this, uh, this battle with back pain all the time. So for those of you who are students right now, or those of you who are per perhaps newer graduates and, and just becoming clinicians, it, it, there's a lot that you have to go through and a lot you have to consider with back pain. But if you stay really disciplined to it and chase down things that are abnormal and watch out for the red flags or the yellow flags, um, you'll get really good at it quickly because you see a ton of back pain. It's just really important to, to stay vigilant. Um, the next point, in low risk patients, consider labs prior to obtaining gallbladder imaging. So I do this a lot um, with a patient that may have epigastric pain. If they're not tender on their examination, you don't necessarily need to jump straight to an ultrasound or a CT scan. You can check labs first. Um, you can make sure that they're tolerating PO. You can make sure that their vital signs stay stable. You don't have to jump straight to doing imaging. In this case, her labs were abnormal, so we did do imaging, but I just want to make that a, a takeaway that you shouldn't necessarily assume that you need to do imaging on all your patients with uh, possible belly problems. Um, next point, common bile duct stones often are not seen directly on the gallbladder ultrasound, but watch for common bile duct dilation. So that's a lot more sensitive to see dilation. Um, and that was the case with our patient today. Um, and then watch for the complications of cholelithiasis, so ascending cholangitis, pancreatitis, and cholecystitis. Okay, so that's the case. I hope y'all enjoyed it. I hope that was fun. I actually had a lot of fun doing that. I wanted to let y'all know that if you enjoy uh, MedGeeks and you enjoy what we're doing and you find these things helpful, I want to tell you about a new thing that we're, we're rolling out, and it actually goes live today, which is kind of exciting. But we have a, uh, a, new, a new product through MedGeek called In The Know, which is a monthly audio review. This is going to be hosted by MedGeek's own Joe Rad, who's a PA. And uh, basically what it's going to be is uh, each month he's going to be going through the most important medical updates that impact you and where you practice. And this is primarily focusing on primary care, internal medicine. He's going to have guests that are giving insights and perspectives on how to handle these topics. And like I said, this is launching today. And it's kind of exciting. Uh, we're, we're excited to talk about this. We're doing early bird pricing today, and y'all are the first people to hear about it right now, so good for you for sticking around. Get started with In The Know for only $9.99 a month. So if you do that, if you do the early bird pricing, we're throwing in a couple bonuses because y'all were here for the case. Thinking Like a Clinician is another program that we have. Uh, I'll let you read about it here in front of us right here, too. And, and Andrew just put up the, uh, the, the link over here on the comments section. I want y'all to check out this link and really explore what this product is. It's really cool. Um, but anyway, this is one of the bonuses you get if you sign up for the early bird pricing. Um, and it's this thinking like a clinician, which is a, a, a course that you kind of go through self-paced and it helps make that transition from student to clinician. And there are five modules. They're all super helpful. You can see all these, uh, these topics that they have here. There's more modules here on the next slide. Um, and basically it just helps kind of bridge that gap going from being a student to a clinician. That's a huge stress making that transition. And we have been through that here at MedGeeks. We know what that feels like. We know how scary that can be and we wanna help. And there's been a lot of people who, who benefit from this. Um, and this is, this is the rest of the modules that all come with thinking like a clinician. This is gonna be included as a bonus as part of the early bird pricing for this new uh, audio resource that we're rolling out today. Then the second bonus is another, uh, another program that we have called Documenting Like a Pro. This is a one month online training with the people here at MedGeeks um, and it's gonna go over several topics. One of them is introduction to documentation um, and documenting quickly. You know, a lot of people have, have questions like what about templates? Uh, how much do I say? You know, when you're a student, you document things a lot differently than when you're a clinician. Um, another question is, you know, I'm taking charts home with me. I don't want to do that. Like, how do I chart faster? Is it okay to chart while I'm in the room? Um, 
you know, with a patient or is that considered rude? We, we talk about that because we, we've gone through that. So um, the intro to documentation is going to be by Joe Rad and the, the quick, quick documentation, the documenting quickly section is going to be talked about by Dr. Luke Hughesby. So check that out. And then uh, documenting like a pro as well includes these two as well. Defensive documentation to prevent getting sued and how to appease insurance companies as well. So again, that is included in the no monthly audio review is rolling out. I'm serious, it's starting today. Check out the link on the, uh, on the top of the chat window on the right side of your screen. Uh, and the early bird pricing only lasts for the next few days. So definitely go to that link to check it out and you'll get those two bonuses like I talked about. If you have any questions, that you want me to, I, I'm the one who hosts the podcast right now as well. So, I mean, if you want me to talk about any topics on the podcast, I've been promoting this website here, askmedgeeks.com. So ask med geeks, anything is kind of a, a really easy way for you to go. Uh, if it's a board review style question or a specific question about a patient that you've seen uh, a question for how to manage a, a specific situation or just topics for future podcasts, uh, go to that website as well. And of course, all of our stuff can be found at medgeeks.co. And we're on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So check us out. And again, that link for this new program that we're rolling out today in the know is at the top of the screen on the right. So check it out. I thank you all very much for joining us for this hour. It looks like we're finishing up right around an hour, which is good. Um, I think you all all had a lot of input to put and I appreciate it. If you have any questions about this, um, this program that we're talking about in the know, the monthly audio review, um, on the, the link up above, there's definitely some stuff that you want to check out. There's a, a place where you can ask questions too. I know that uh, Andrew and Joe have been working really hard on getting the first uh, episode for next month up and running, and uh, I got to hear a little bit about what it's about. So, and I think y'all are going to like it. I'm looking forward to it myself. So, Check it out. And as always, I really appreciate y'all joining us. And we will see y'all when we do this again next month. Thanks so much. Bye.